So in this lesson of the immune response, we're going to go over how white blood cells destroy pathogens, why our body creates a fever and why that's beneficial to our survival. And finally, how does a series of 15 quintillion proteins in your body right now act as one of your best innate immunity defenses? Now, this is all under innate immunity, which is your rapid non-changing second line of defense. And remember the crux of the innate immune response is inflammation. If you haven't seen my video on inflammation, I'll attach a link in the description below. So let's jump right into it. So recall, the number one goal of inflammation is to deliver white blood cells that were floating around in these blood vessels into the site of injury or infection. So you have two changes occurring at the level of blood vessels. The blood vessel gets larger or vasodilates and pores generate between these lining cells called endothelial cells of the blood vessel. Ultimately, these two things drive more white blood cells to the site of the injury, and they allow the white blood cells to escape the blood vessel and move into tissue to do the destroying. Now, white blood cells are quite fascinating. In medicine, we use them as a marker for infection. So if a person has an increased white blood cell count, that's a detective clue that they likely have an infection. So normally one ml of blood has about 5,000 to 10,000 white blood cells. They're about 14 micrometers in size, double the size of a red blood cell, and they're super effective at killing. Now they form this huge family. So before we explain the mechanism of white blood cell destruction, let's have a look at this white blood cell family. Now the key take home point is all white blood cells are made in the bone marrow. And that's why bone marrow transplants, you might have heard sometimes in the media or in news articles, they're quite important for survival of certain patients, particularly those who can't make their own white blood cells. So in the bone marrow, we create stem cells and these stem cells will eventually differentiate into all the white blood cells that we know. Now you don't need to know these key terms. The key term you do need to know is that a white blood cell is formally known as a leukocyte. That is the umbrella name. Now they're all made in the bone marrow and eventually they will form different subtypes of white blood cells. You can see there's a line of stem cells called lymphoid progenitor cells that will eventually differentiate into the white blood cells that remain in the lymphatic system. So we'll talk about lymphatic system soon, but you just have to understand it's a series of vessels that contains clear lymph fluid and immune cells. So contrastingly to the lymphoid progenitor cells, we also have myeloid progenitor cells. You don't need to know these names again. You simply need to know what these end cells are. The myeloid progenitor cells form your red blood cells, which carry oxygen and your platelets, which are important in coagulation of blood. But these two white blood cells are your high yield pointers. The most important white blood cell for you to know under this lineage is the macrophage. Following the macrophage, you also need to know about the neutrophil. Now, the macrophage and neutrophil are collectively called phagocytes. The term phagocyte literally means big eater. So you can imagine these two cells are the two key cells that move into tissue and destroy a pathogen. And they do it by literally eating them. Now these cells, the lymphoid cells, they form lymphocytes. And these cells are intrinsic to the adaptive immune system. So we're gonna cover them much later. But I want you to look at the structure of these cells. You'll notice that the B cell contains antibodies on its surface. Now that's a clue for later, but all the antibodies ever to be produced in the human body will come from this B cell. So again, to clarify, the key take home point is leukocytes are white blood cells. Now you can classify them into lymphocytes. So those are your T and B cells that we saw. We're not gonna talk about them in this lesson. And then the phagocytes, which quite literally mean big eater. 
Now there are two types of phagocytes, the neutrophil and the macrophage. Now note that the neutrophil looks slightly different to the macrophage. The neutrophil is shown here on a blood smear, and you can see it has a very multi-lobated nucleus. What that simply means is the nucleus has been clumped up into multiple different weird-looking irregular lobes. The macrophage, contrastingly, has a neater-looking nucleus. There's also a few granules here in the neutrophil, and we're going to talk about this quite soon. Now, in inflammation, white blood cells move to the site of injury. The first white blood cell to move to the site of injury is the neutrophil. It's the first white blood cell. Now, neutrophils have one goal, destroy and die. They're quite brave, they move straight into the site of injury, and they undergo phagocytosis or big eating until they eventually die. Macrophages, on the other hand, are longer lasting. They don't aim to die. They're more like the generals of the war field. If the infection is quite severe, macrophages will move in approximately a day or two after your neutrophils. Once the macrophages move in, they aim to phagocytose again and again and again. We also have our lymphocytes here. So recall they're part of the adaptive immune response. And there's your T and your B cells. Now let's talk a bit about how phagocytosis actually occurs. So this is a great schematic to show you exactly what happens. And there's a lot of YouTube videos. I'm going to link it on our website under this video. But note, the phagocyte originally changes the structure of its cell membrane. Its cytoskeleton, or the little proteins that make up the cell membrane, the skeleton of the cell, will change their shape to fit around the pathogen. Once they fit around the pathogen, they will swallow it up. And they swallow it up and hold it in a jail cell, this vesicle known as a phagosome. Eventually, that phagosome is going to fuse with a lysosome. Now, recall, the lysosome is just the digestive organelle of the cell. So it contains all your free radicals and your hydrogen ions and all your toxic compounds that are great for destroying an organism. So when the jail cell gets filled with this acid and these degradative compounds, the pathogen will be destroyed. That is the mechanism of phagocytosis. So systemic responses is just a fancy way of saying, what are some responses that occur at the whole body level? Now, there are two key ones that you should note. And the most important one is fever. You definitely would have had fever before. And it feels awful. If you're really lethargic, you might have sweats, or you might have the opposite, chills where you feel extremely cold. Now, all of this happens because of these white blood cells and the chemicals that they release when they're activated. Now, we talk through sound waves. That's how humans communicate. White blood cells speak to one another, not in the language of English and not through sound waves, but through chemical molecules, specifically proteins known as cytokines. So when a macrophage gets activated after it phagocytoses a pathogen, it's going to alert the rest of the immune system. So it starts to release a storm of cytokines. Now the cytokines fill up your bloodstream and they travel straight up to the brain. Now in the brain, right here in this structure, right where my cursor is, we have the hypothalamus. Hypo meaning below, and it's below the thalamus, as you can see there. So it's called the hypothalamus. Now, the one word I want you to remember for hypothalamus, because it comes up later in module eight, is hypothalamus equals homeostasis. So when these cytokines move up, they're going to disrupt homeostasis, which is just the balance in your body. Specifically, the cytokines are going to disrupt temperature homeostasis. And hence why you get a fever. Now, the goal of a fever is poorly understood, and fevers can kill a person if it's excessively high because it destroys their enzymes. But the goal that scientists believe is that it slows down the activity of a pathogen, and it speeds up immune cell activity. 
Now, these same cytokines also cause another side effect, and this is not so good for us. It's wasting. You might notice when you're sick for a long time and bedbound, your muscles shrink and you might feel a bit weaker than usual. Now, this is much more pronounced in cancer patients and those with chronic long-term inflammation diseases. So what happens to them is the release of cytokines breaks down their tissue and they appear much thinner as a result. Finally, we're going to talk about the complement system. Now, the complement system is not living. There's no cells involved. They're simply proteins that float around in the blood. There's about C1 to C20, about 30 different proteins. 30 because we have C1A, C1B, C1C, etc. Overall in your body, you have about 15 quintillion complement proteins. They're all over every single fluid. Now they're quite dangerous. You can think of them as mini little bombs that activate one another. Now they're activated by antigens binding to antibody. So they're activated by the immune response. Once activated, they cause the activation of other subsequent complement proteins. So you can see here, C3 goes and activates C5. And this process keeps on going until we form this structure known as a membrane attack complex. This is quite literally a complex of proteins that moves in, punctures a cell, almost like a machine gun bullet, and causes fluid to move out of the cell until it dies. The complement system can, only, can also tag cells. And when it tags cells, the immune response is heightened in its activity to them so it can increase and signal phagocytosis. And that's our overview of the other components of the innate immune response. Thanks for watching.